Welcome to Hillcrest Baptist Church. We're so glad that you're able to join us here tonight for a Sunday evening worship service. Please let us know more about you or share a prayer request with us by filling out the connection form at visithillcrest.org slash live. Before we get started with worship tonight, let us bow our heads in prayer and ask God to bless our evening service today. Our Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you once again for just a wonderful week and a great Sunday morning. I pray, Lord, that you'll be with our Sunday evening service tonight, be with the singing, be with the announcements, be with especially the preaching of your word. I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to make a decision for you, help us to remain faithful unto you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Church family, let's gather around and sing a few songs as we give God all the glory he truly deserves tonight. church family. Please don't forget to let us know that you're watching tonight's service by checking in at the top of our live stream page at visithillcrest.org slash live. We're going to sing one final song before pastor comes and preaches the word of God tonight. Good evening and welcome to tonight's service and uh, such a blessing to gather with you once again via live stream uh, on the Lord's Day as we study the Word of God once again uh, here this evening. If you have your Bibles, turn with me tonight and uh, we're going to go to Mark chapter number 13. Mark chapter number 13 as we're continuing uh, in our sermon series entitled The Story uh, About Jesus and we're just going verse by verse through the Gospel of Mark 
as we study the life of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that brings us tonight to Mark chapter number 13. And uh, this is a, a portion of scripture that is commonly known uh, as the Olivet Discourse, simply because it was a discourse that took place uh, for the most part uh, on uh, the Mount of Olives. And so uh, there's some uh, important truths that Jesus shares with us here within this chapter. And uh, a lot of doctrine, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of theology, prophecy that we find here. And so we want to we wanna travel over these uh, verses carefully, and we want to make sure that we have a good understanding of what the Lord is speaking about. And so here tonight, this is going to be somewhat of a of an extensive Bible study as we focus on the first eight verses of Mark chapter number thirteen, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna cover these verses and study them tonight, uh, and then towards the end, I'd like to give you just a few applicable truths uh, so that we can apply these to our lives here this evening. And so tonight I've entitled the message, The Prophecy uh, About the Future, Part Number One. And so there's going to be uh, several other messages uh, coming out of this all of it discourse, but tonight we're going to begin with Part Number One, The Prophecy uh, About the Future. And so Mark chapter 13, verse number one, uh, down to verse number eight. The Bible reads here in verse number one, and as he went out of the temple, one of his disciples saith unto him, Master, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here. And Jesus answering said unto him, Seest thou these great buildings? Uh, there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives over against the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign when all these things shall be fulfilled? And Jesus answering them began to say, Take heed, lest any man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And when ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, be not troubled, for such things must needs be, but the end shall not be yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be earthquakes in diverse places, and there shall be famines and troubles. These are the beginnings of sorrows. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this evening. We thank you for uh, this time that you've given us once again, that we can study thy word to be challenged and encouraged and uh, strengthened through the truth that we find uh, within the scriptures. And so, Lord, we ask tonight that Holy Spirit of God, uh, you'd give us understanding. And uh, Lord, as we think about uh, this portion of the Gospels, the Olivet Discourse, there's, uh, there are many who have uh, read into these verses, which does not exist within this passage, and have developed uh, different kinds of erroneous doctrines. And so, Father, I pray that you'd help us uh, here tonight to have a, a clear understanding of, of, uh, of the truths that we find here within these verses and Lord, I understand we don't have uh, all the time to be exhaustive in our study of, of what's taking place here. But Lord, with, with what we're able to study, I pray, Father, that you give us a good understanding. Uh, and then, Father, I pray that you'd help us to apply these truths so that we might live differently in the times that we live in here tonight for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for all that you'll do. We pray now that you bless uh, this time together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we come now to Mark chapter number 13, we find the Lord Jesus Christ giving several prophecies concerning the future of Israel, concerning the Jewish people. Now, it's important to note here tonight, by way of introduction, even before we study one verse, uh, that nowhere in these prophecies is the church mentioned. Uh, nowhere do we find in the Olivet Discourse the mention of the New Testament local church, and nowhere do we find any mention concerning the event of the rapture, the, the catching away of the church. And the reason why is because the question had nothing to do with the church, and therefore the answer that Jesus gave had nothing to do with with the church as well. Warren Wiersbe said, we must keep in mind the Jewish atmosphere of the discourse. 
It grew out of some questions asked of a Jewish rabbi by four Jewish men about the future of the Jewish temple. And so these prophecies are primarily concerning the Jewish people and the nation of Israel. However, there are important truths that apply to believers uh, within the church age tonight, for Jesus is simply describing and he is prophesying about the events that would occur between his first coming and his return, not the rapture, uh, but his return, speaking about his second coming, in which he will touch down to earth and he will establish the physical millennial kingdom. And because in this intervening period between uh, the first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and the return, the establishment uh, of his kingdom, within this intervening period, the church is present, at least until the rapture prior to the tribulation. And therefore, it is important for us to study these verses and take heed to the warnings and the principles within these prophecies. And so tonight, I want you to notice with me several uh, prophecies that Jesus gives about the future of Israel uh, and the Jewish people. Uh, and then once again, uh, I would uh, like to, at the end of the message, very briefly give us uh, just a couple applications for our Christian lives here tonight. But notice with me, as we begin in verse number one, we find here the destruction of the Jewish temple, the destruction of the Jewish temple. It says, and as he went out of the temple, remember, uh, this is still uh, the third day of, of Jesus coming and, uh, and ministering within the city of Jerusalem. This is the week uh, of his crucifixion. And so just a few days away uh, from him being lifted up on the cross, and uh, it's been a full day for the Lord. He's been uh, debating with several uh, religious leaders uh, throughout uh, throughout the temple. And then, of course, as we think about the end of chapter number 12, he noticed uh, the widow that gave her two mites uh, into the treasury there within the court of women. And so all of that has taken place. It's still the same day. And now Jesus is departing from the temple with his disciples. And so as he went out of the temple... One of his disciples saith unto him, Master, uh, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here. Uh, and so after a long day of, of debating, Jesus now leaves the temple. He's headed towards uh, the Mount of Olives, uh, which is just on the other side of the Kidron Valley. And as they traveled, the disciples looked upon the temple with great amazement and with great admiration, and one of them said to the Lord, Master, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here. You see, the temple underwent a renovation and uh, an expansion under King Herod, uh, which lasted for over 80 years. It began around 20 BC, and it was com and it was completed around AD 64. And so, in the time of Christ, although the project wasn't completely finished, it was still quite a sight to behold. Uh, the area of the temple complex within its walls was about 35 acres. Uh, it was filled with magnificent and ornate uh, patios and colonnades and, and porticos and courtyards. Uh, the stones that were used to build the walls of the temple were finely cut out of white limestone, and they were massive in size. Uh, some of them were uh, 40 feet long and 18 feet tall. Near the base of the temple, these stones weighed in excess of 100 tons each. That's 200,000 pounds. They were perfectly cut and fitted within the structure of the temple. Furthermore, much of the stonework was overlaid with pure gold, which would cause the temple to glisten in the sun, looking like a jewel on top of a hill. And so the Jewish people were filled with wonder. 
uh, as they saw this expansion, as they saw this uh, renovation uh, under King Herod, they were filled with wonder concerning this building. They were uh, filled with pleasure, and they were filled within their hearts with nationalistic pride as they looked upon this incredible structure. And so the disciples pointed out to Jesus the beauty and the awe of this massive temple. And to this, Jesus replies with a prophecy in verse number two. Notice what the Bible says. It says, And Jesus answering said unto him, Seest thou these great buildings? There shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And Jesus simply says it's all going to be gone. And uh, there's not going to be one stone which will be left upon another, this temple will be utterly destroyed. And that's exactly what happened about 37 years later, for history records for us uh, that in AD 70, the Roman army, led by General Titus, besieged Jerusalem, and they destroyed the city, and they burned it with fire, and the heat ended up melting the gold on the temple, and it ran down into the cracks of the stones and onto the rubble below, and the Roman soldiers searching for that gold in attempts to harvest that gold, uh, they went through the ruins, and they went through the cracks between the stones, and, and uh, between all of uh, the layers of the stones that were there within the structure, and literally Literally, they overturned every stone, leaving not one stone upon another. And so Jesus' prophecy was literally fulfilled uh, as, uh, as about 37 years later, there came about the destruction of the Jewish temple under General Titus. And so we find here, first of all tonight, in these first two verses, uh, the destruction of of the Jewish temple. His disciple comes to him, wow, Lord, look at this temple, and it's marvelous, and look at its uh, magnificence. And Jesus replies to that, there's not going to be one stone left upon another. This will be completely destroyed. And that prophecy is fulfilled back in AD 70. And then as we continue here tonight, I want you to notice with me not only the destruction of the Jewish temple, but we find next the devastation of the end times, the devastation of the end times. And in verse number three, it begins now uh, with a request, a request uh, from the disciples. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives over against the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, tell us when shall these things be and what shall be the sign when all these things shall be fulfilled? Uh, Now we find here a little time has passed. They have crossed over the Kidron Valley, and they have settled down on the western slope of the Mount of Olives, which overlooks the eastern wall uh, and the eastern portion of the temple uh, and the city of Jerusalem. And now Peter, James, John, and Andrew, these four, the Bible says, uh, they approach the Lord privately to ask him further questions. And basically they ask the Lord when and what? Those were the two questions. When will this happen? And what are the indicators or signs leading up to this event? Uh, Now, they would have had the destruction of the temple on their mind, for they just spoke about that uh, prior to coming to the Mount of Olives. But additionally, moreover, they were also curious about his coming kingdom, the overthrow of Rome, and the establishment of the Messiah's rule and reign, and the end, the the, the termination of this current age. And we find that in a parallel passage in Matthew chapter number 24, where uh, the gospel writer Matthew details for us a little bit more concerning that question. And the Bible reads there, and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately saying, Tell us when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Uh, Now, they're not asking about his return 
for they didn't quite understand that aspect of God's plan. And so we got to put ourselves in the shoes of these disciples and, and recognize that they didn't have uh, the knowledge concerning the scriptures, concerning the plan of God that we have here tonight. And so they did not understand uh, that aspect of God's plan concerning the death and the resurrection and then the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so they were not asking necessarily about his return, but what they were asking was, when is his kingdom coming? Meaning, when will he, quote unquote, come to rule and reign over Israel and usher in a new world or a new age, putting an end to the current age, the current oppression under Rome. And so they were asking, Lord, uh, when is it going to come? When is this going to happen? When are you going to enter into Jerusalem and overthrow everything? And is it going to be uh, Is it going to be this week? Uh, is it going to be next month? Is it going to be in a few years? They were not thinking about the return and the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. They, uh, they did not understand that truth. And so they were wondering, when? When? Is it going to be soon? Is it going to be uh, in a few years, and when are you going to put an end to this world, an end to this age, this constant oppression under the Roman Empire? Uh, one commentary writes, they supposed the kingdom would be at the same time, speaking about the disciples, and immediately followed the destruction of the temple. That he was come in the flesh and was the true Messiah, they firmly believed. He was with them, and they expected he would continue with them, for they had no notion of his leaving them and coming again. When he at any time spake of his dying and rising from the dead, they seemed not to understand it. Wherefore, this coming of his, the sign of which they inquire, is not to be understood of his coming a second time to judge the world at the last day, but of his coming in his kingdom and glory. And so the disciples thought it would be soon. Uh, they thought probably immediately following the destruction uh, of the temple, as Jesus prophesied, that, that he would establish uh, his kingdom uh, there in Jerusalem. But the truth was, it wouldn't be until Jesus' second coming that the kingdom would be established. Now, once again, they did not quite understand all of that. Nevertheless, the Lord gives his prophecies concerning the signs that would precede his return and the coming kingdom. And so we find here the request, and of course that leads us to the remainder of our passage here tonight, and that is the reply of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in this reply, we must understand that much of it points to the tribulation period, uh, the seven years of judgment that follows the rapture of the church. As, as believers, as the church of God here tonight, we do not need to worry about the judgments in the tribulation, for that has nothing to do with the church. The church will be caught away. The church will be raptured prior to the seven years of tribulation. And so that period uh, comes after the church is removed, and it comes directly before the actual second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. For in the rapture, he calls the church up from the clouds. But after that seven year is completed, Jesus Christ comes down, and physically, it is his second coming on earth and the establishment of his kingdom. And so uh, with that in mind, Jesus' reply here uh, primarily has to do with the things that would take place during that tribulation period. The culmination of these prophetic events will take place during those seven years. However, we do see signs and a partial fulfillment of these prophetic events, even in our day to day. And an interesting phrase that we find at the end of our passage in verse number eight is these are the beginnings of sorrows. And that word sorrows there that we find at the end of verse number eight is the Greek word Odin, and it means pain or travail, especially at childbirth. And so it's speaking about birth pains. And so just as a mother's birth pangs increase in frequency 
and intensity at the moment of labor, these prophetic events as well will increase in their frequency and intensity in the last days in the tribulation period. And just like there are indications and signs of the coming birth and minor sensations of birth pangs prior to the time of labor leading up to it, likewise, there are indicators and signs today of events and devastations that are leading into the time of the tribulation. And so although these events will be completely fulfilled in the time of the tribulation, we can see the partial fulfillment of it today as our world draws closer and closer to those final days. And so we can see the indications of how our times uh, is, is, is moving towards that tribulation period. Uh, John Phillips said this, like much Bible prophecy, this end times prophecy uh, had both a near impending partial fulfillment and a final end times complete fulfillment. And so once again, although this is primarily about the tribulation period and the culmination of uh, the final moments of those birth pains, when when it all begins to increase drastically, uh, exponentially in frequency and intensity. Although that's the season that Jesus is speaking about here, uh, we can see all the indicators and the signs even today, uh, even in the church age, even prior to our rapture, that that many of these prophetic events are are coming into place in preparation for that time of tribulation. And so we find here as we continue some of these prophetic events that uh, will take place and some of its partial fulfillment even uh, today, uh, ever since the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ, we find, first of all, there's going to be deception. In verse 5 and 6, it says, And Jesus answering them began to say, Take heed, lest any man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. And ever since the time of Christ, there have been an increasing number of false prophets who have professed to be the Messiah. They have professed to be uh, the chosen Savior of the world. I think about uh, in the second century, after the death of the apostles, a man by the name of Simon bar Kokhba declared himself to be the Messiah around 132 AD. His claims garnered many followers, leading to a Jewish uprising against Rome, and this rebellion resulted in the complete destruction of Jerusalem in 135 uh, AD. And so here was a man that came about, and uh, whether whether he was uh, a little bit mentally insane or whether he had some ulterior motives concerning that profession, he came out and declared, I am the Messiah. And obviously he was a false prophet, a false Messiah proclaiming to be Christ, and we find his destruction, and uh, we find uh, the the end result in 135 A.D. I think about also characters like uh, Jim Jones. He was the leader of the People's Temple, and some of you might be a little bit more familiar uh, with this character. In the 1970s, Jim Jones abandoned uh, all pretense of being a Christian minister, and he began to declare to his followers uh, that he was the reincarnation of Buddha and of Gandhi and of Vladimir Lenin and Jesus. And in 1978, after several conflicts with the law, he encouraged uh, his followers. At that time, they were in a compound in South America, and he encouraged his followers to consume a fruit drink uh, that contained a, a, a lethal combination of cyanide and sedatives. And on that day, 909 followers of this false Messiah committed suicide. And really, the list goes on and on as we think about religious charlatans, uh, as we think about even political characters and dictators and despots who have claimed that they were uh, they were God, or they claimed that they were a demigod, or they claimed that they were uh, godlike, or they are the Messiah, or they're the Savior, and, and they're the Christ. And ever since the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ, that has continued, and it increases more and more as we draw closer to the end times. And of course, all of that will climax in the tribulation period uh, when the Antichrist himself declares 
to be God. And so we find here Jesus says there's going to be many deceptions, uh, many deceivers. And so take heed, beware, be on guard uh, concerning these false messiahs. And so we find the deception, but we also find the discord. And in verse number seven, uh, down to the first portion of verse number eight, it says, And when ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, uh, be not troubled, for such things must needs be, but the end shall not be yet. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And Jesus says, as we draw closer to the end, as we draw closer to the actual coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, civilization will not become more peaceful. Uh, they will not uh, uh, have an increasing number of treaties and accords, but instead there will be more wars. Uh, there will be more battles and more conflicts between kingdoms and nations and people groups. According to Will Durant, who is a historian, uh, he, he said that in over 3,400 years of recorded history, there have only been 268 years of peace. And according to several different studies, there are currently over 50 wars, battles, and conflicts that are ongoing right now throughout the world. And so Jesus says, prior to my physical return, the second coming and the establishment of my kingdom, he says, there's going to be deceivers. There's going to be a lot of deception. He says, there's also going to be a lot of discord, a lot of kingdoms rising against kingdoms and nations against nations. He goes on in verse number eight, and uh, he tells us there's going to be disasters. It says, and there shall be earthquakes in diverse places. And I think about even just recently on February the 13th, just a few days ago at 6.07 uh, a.m. in the morning, 44 miles uh, from the city of Fukushima, there was a 7.1 magnitude earthquake uh, that struck uh, 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 next to the country of Japan. And thank God that there were no uh, deaths and casualties reported with this earthquake However, that's rarely the case. And according to one study, over 13 million people have died in earthquakes in the last 4,000 years. And so Jesus says, as we draw closer to uh, his return, there will be earthquakes in diverse places. There will be uh, natural disasters occurring more frequently and with greater intensity, with all of them culminating during the time of the tribulation. And then in verse uh, number eight, in the final portion, uh, he says there's going to be despair. It says, and there shall be famines and troubles. These are the beginnings of sorrows. And Jesus speaks about increasing famines. And uh, according to the United Nations Food Agency, 600 90 million people regularly go to bed hungry and malnourished throughout the world. Uh, Jesus also speaks about growing diseases, not only the famines and the hunger that pervades uh, globally, but also uh, the growing diseases. And Mark mentions here troubles uh, in verse number eight, but Matthew once again in a parallel passage uh, mentions pestilences. And in Matthew 24, verse number seven, for nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. And pestilences is speaking about diseases, uh, illnesses that people uh, will face, and more and more so as we draw closer to the tribulation. I think about the Black Death. Uh, that was a bubonic plague pandemic occurring uh, in Africa and Europe and Asia from 1346 to 1353. And as many as 200 million people globally died of the Black Death. I think about the Spanish uh, influenza that took place in, in the early 1900s. Approximately 50 million deaths were reported according to the CDC. 
And then, of course, we think about the AIDS epidemic and, and the Ebola virus and SARS and, and, and the bird flus and, of course, currently the COVID-19 pandemic that has claimed about 2.5 million lives worldwide. And these pestilences will increase in our time. And uh, many medical experts have said, yes, we're going to get over uh, this coronavirus and, and the COVID-19 will come to an end and we're going to get a handle on what's going on with this pandemic. But that doesn't mean that there's going to be no other pestilence that comes uh, in the future for the Bible prophesies. And Jesus tells us within his word that as we draw closer to the return of Jesus Christ and the tribulation, these will increase more and more. And eventually they will come to a peak as a worldwide catastrophe during the tribulation. And you see, all of these events that Jesus speaks about here within these verses coincides with the four sealed judgments that we find in the book of Revelation. And in Revelation chapter 6, verse number 1, down to verse number 8, we think about these uh, four seal judgments, uh, the, the four horsemen uh, that we find here within these verses. And, and uh, these judgments coincide with what Jesus speaks about here in Mark 13. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And, and I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was death, and hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. And so we find in our passage here tonight, Jesus, in his reply, uh, gives to these disciples these alarming signs that will precede his coming, his return to establish his kingdom. And although these uh, prophecies deal with the Jewish people and the nation of Israel, for us as a church, uh, there are a couple takeaways and applications for us here tonight. And very quickly and briefly, I want to give you just two uh, before we close our, our, our sermon here this evening. And uh, number one, we can rest assured in the rapture of the church. And we can have comfort within our hearts, although we see some signs leading up to the tribulation. Uh, although even uh, tonight, uh, in our current uh, in our current period in the church age, we we see some natural disasters. We see obviously a virus that is permeating uh, throughout our communities, and we see uh, some of these uh, some of these difficult events taking place. It is nowhere. Uh, compared to what it will be like during the tribulation, for at that time, uh, the frequency and the intensity of, of it all uh, will increase exponentially, just like a mother uh, in her final moments when she goes into labor, the birth pangs uh, begin to increase with intensity and frequency. And so we see signs of it, but we can rest assured here tonight, before it gets to the tribulation, we will be raptured away. Uh, and the believers, the New Testament local church, will be raptured and caught up with the Lord in the clouds, and we will not be part of the tribulation, which is the judgment of God upon uh, uh, specifically the Jewish people, the nation of Israel. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4, verse number 16 and 18, the Bible says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. 
then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. And that's what it means there, to be raptured, to be caught up together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10, it says, And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. And so here tonight, we can, we can uh, have that comfort uh, concerning the truth here, uh, that yes, dark days are coming in the tribulation, but we as the church are not appointed unto that wrath. No, we will be raptured away, and we will be caught up, and we will be with the Lord. And then secondly, could I say this here tonight? Not only uh, can we rest assured in the rapture of the church, but then secondly, we must recognize the season that we are currently living in, and we must be busy for the Lord. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24, the Bible says, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. And the writer of Hebrews is teaching us uh, as we observe some of the signs, as we draw closer uh, to the return of Christ, the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, let us not be distracted. Uh, let us not live with the philosophy that uh, it cannot be today, it is not imminent, and therefore we can simply eat, drink, and be merry, and, and just live however we please, but, but let us be wise. And let us be circumspect, observing the times and realizing what is going on around us as we see the signs, as we uh, see the indicators, as we see even the political forces uh, coming into play in preparation for the events of the tribulation. Let us be wise and recognize that this season that we're living in the last days. And therefore, it behooves us to be busy for the Lord. Uh, it compels us that we personally would live faithfully, that we would live holy lives before the Lord, and that we would not be pursuing after the things of this world and the things that are temporal in this life, but rather we would have our eyes fixed on Jesus and our eyes fixed on the things of eternity. And that would stir us up uh, to do greater things and more things for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. To tell others about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, his love, his grace, his redemption. And be busy in encouraging one another in the New Testament local church to edify one another that we would live standing upon the promises of God. It says there, to provoke one another unto love and to good works and not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, exhorting one another so much the more, not so much the less, not remain in the status quo, but so much the more as he see the day approaching. And as we look around us here tonight, as we think about the circumstances and, and some of uh, the events that are taking place all around us here this evening. We would have to be blind as a Christian to not realize that Jesus is coming, and he's coming soon, and we must be busy in the work of the Lord. We must watch and occupy, and we must continually press forward by faith and fulfill the Great Commission of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so let us be comforted that we will be taken away in the rapture. We will not be part of that tribulation period. 
But at the same time, let us be wise and let us be aware of what's happening in our current season. And let us recognize time is short and we must be busy today for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so here tonight we find the destruction of the Jewish temple that was fulfilled back in 70 AD. And then we think about the devastation of the end times, uh, the request, the reply. There's going to be deception, discord, disasters, and despair. Next week, as we gather together, I'll be preaching part number two, and uh, we'll move a little bit further uh, into the tribulation period and some some uh, more details concerning uh, these prophetic events. And so let's pray, and uh, we'll ask the Lord to bless as we close tonight. Father, we thank you so much for this evening, and thank you for... Uh, Lord, just the truth of God's word. And thank you for the promises that we can find. And, and uh, Lord, I know that there are some that would uh, look into this portion of Scripture and, and they would interpret it uh, slightly different. And, and, Father, they would come out with some doctrines that would cause a lot of fear and a lot of anxiety. Uh, but, Lord, I thank you that, that through the Scriptures, you make it clear to us uh, that you have a plan for the church. And uh, you also have a, a timetable and a plan uh, for the nation of Israel, and and uh, Lord, you're gonna you're gonna rapture us away, and uh, we're not gonna be part of that tribulation. And and what a wonderful uh, comfort that is, and uh, help us, Lord, to uh, not only not only rejoice in that comforting principle and truth here tonight, uh, but then Father, help us to realize that uh, time is short, and the signs are around us, the indicators are are all around us. All we have to do is turn on the news and. And there it is. We can see uh, your sovereign plan all coming together. And, uh, and Lord, in a, in a short period of time, uh, those birth pangs are, are going to begin. And uh, the tribulation. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us to be faithful uh, in, in our generation uh, to reach people with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, that they might live with peace and hope uh, and joy in their salvation, and in the promises of the Word of God. And so, Lord, help us to, to be faithful Christians and help us to be a faithful church. With your heads bowed and eyes closed just for a moment here tonight, uh, maybe God has spoken to your heart concerning uh, some of the things that we spoke about here this evening. Uh, I encourage you that you would take this time right now and uh, you would respond and uh, reply uh, to the Lord and to the Holy Spirit of God as, as He's spoken to you. And uh, let's take a moment to pray. And uh, let's take a moment to reflect and uh, respond to the Lord uh, here tonight. So let's take a few moments to do that, and then I'll pray, and we'll conclude our service. Father, thank you once again for this evening, and uh, thank you for thy word. And uh, we pray now that you'd help us to uh, live with, with confidence in you, in the word of God. Help us live faithfully. Help us not to uh, waste time. Help us not to be distracted uh, in the things of this world, in the things of this life, in the things that are temporary, in the things that are going to vanish away. But Lord, help us to focus and live our lives for the things that are eternal, uh, the things that will last forever. And so, Father, help us to uh, be faithful and help us to, uh, Lord, continue to press forward uh, in the things that you've called us to do. Father, we love you and thank you for tonight and uh, bless us and dismiss us with thy grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, once again, thank you so much for joining us tonight for this evening service. And uh, as I mentioned before, that was part one concerning uh, uh, the prophecy about the future that Jesus gives us. And we'll continue uh, with some more of that uh, in the upcoming uh, Sunday evening service. And so I encourage you to be faithful and uh, be a part of that. Just a few announcements before we close here tonight. First of all, uh, we, we had our ministry involvement Sunday now a few weeks ago, and, and I just want to encourage you, if you're still praying about that, Lord's working upon your heart, go to our website, visit hillcrest.org slash volunteer, and uh, you can fill out that form and indicate that you're interested in serving somewhere uh, in the ministry of Hillcrest Baptist Church to edify the body of Christ, and uh, you can fill out that interest form, and we'll be in touch 
uh, and we'll let you know uh, just the process and where you might be able to jump in and, and uh, what the tentative schedule might be. And so uh, sign up for that, and uh, probably within about the next week or so, uh, we're going to go ahead and organize all of that and arrange all the schedules, and uh, we, will, uh, we will be in touch, and we'll let you know uh, how that's all going to work. And so once again, visit hillcrest.org slash volunteer. For the ladies... Uh, this upcoming Saturday, February uh, the 27th, there's the Ladies Fellowship at 11 o'clock, and uh, there's uh, there's there's probably going to be just just a few changes, and and we'll let you know more about that as we as we draw closer to that Saturday, and uh, we've we've had some uh, issues uh, because of COVID and and uh, things along those lines, and so we we need to make a little bit of an adjustment, and and that's kind of what we've been doing ever since uh, March of 2020, just always making an adjustment uh, because of COVID, and it seems like we're going to have to do that again with this ladies' fellowship. And so uh, so my wife will reach out to you and give you all the information, the details, uh, but the fellowship will still go on this Saturday, uh, February the 27th, and uh, we'll give you all the details for that. It's going to be 11 o'clock in the morning. And then next Sunday uh, morning for the morning service, we have a, a special guest preacher with us. His name is uh, Pastor Richard Kim, and he's one of the uh, uh, pastors over at my father's church, Bible Baptist Church in Gardena. And uh, he's going to be with us that Sunday morning. He'll be preaching for us. And uh, we've entitled that Sunday, Renew Sunday. And uh, I just want to encourage you to come into that weekend with a heart that is that is prayed up, and uh, a heart that is that is prepared and ready to hear uh, from the Word of God. I know it's going to be a help and a challenge, and uh, we want to make sure that our heart is ready. As the preacher will come, he'll be ready. Uh, the Holy Spirit of God will be ready, but oftentimes we're not ready. And so let me encourage you uh, to take some time to really pray and seek the Lord and uh, prepare and be ready uh, to say, Lord, here am I, and uh, speak to me, send me, whatever you want to do, here am I, and uh, I'm ready to hear uh, from the voice of the Lord. And so that's going to be next Sunday morning, uh, Renew Sunday. We're going to have a great time with that. Well, once again, thank you so much for being with us here tonight. If I can be a blessing in any way, uh, please uh, reach out to me, call me, text me, email me, uh, however you'd like to uh, communicate, and I'd uh, love to be a blessing to you in whatever way that I can. Well, at this time, we're going to sing one final song, and then we'll be dismissed with our service. Once again, we're so glad that you were able to join us here for our Sunday evening worship service. If you need anything at all, please do not hesitate to let us know by filling out the connection form at visithillcrest.org slash live. We're going to sing one final dismissal song as we dismiss tonight, and let's sing it out loud together as a church family. Thanks again for joining us here for our live stream service tonight. Have a wonderful week and God bless.